So now you have people that are just for the first time experienced like, oh, I'm at home. I just walked to get a drink. I'm listening to the word and I just paid. I'm okay. No one stole my shit. I'm selling a domain names in, in my school just to get some money, you know. But I think I was like 16 or 17. We had like a, a police raid, you know. I started getting checks like at some point of people paying 10, 20 grand a month. They were advertising so much on TV, consumers would go and look for more information online, and that's why I scooped them up. They needed some international SEO advice, and they got in touch with me, right? So I spent worth of $30 million myself on Facebook ads. I knew that I had something that was extraordinary, that we can scale this, like, very, because it's super hard to copy this product. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Conversations with a Marketer. My name is Chad Wilton, and today's guest, we have the one, the only, Nick Shackelford, co-founder of Structured Social. He is a good friend of mine. Uh, he's been a speaker of mine at Affiliate World Asia and Europe, Bangkok, and in Barcelona. Uh, All-around great guy. Most of you probably have seen him or heard his name. Super generous in a lot of the Facebook community and groups. Um, he's normally the guy first to offer up his hand for help. So when I knocked on the door to have him on the show, he obliged. Um, today, you know, we discuss a lot of things. We dig a little bit into how he got into the industry, of course, because if, if many of you have heard his story before, he was a professional soccer player um, for LA Galaxy. But I wanted to know how that translated and how he got into the industry and what kind of uh, skills that he was he able to leverage from that. Of course, we dig into uh, the current climate with e-commerce, um, what some of his um, his clients are experiencing right now. But the biggest one that came out of nowhere during this episode is later on, near the end of it, where he unveils this massive audience that is coming online for the first time. And not just that, that they are coming online and technically forced to get a habit of using their credit cards and actually making a purchase. Massive audience, you'll have to tune in um, for the whole episode to find out where you should be sending your money next. Um, hope you enjoy it. Uh, again, the one, the only, Nick Shackelford, Structured Social. Enjoy. Welcome everyone to another episode of Conversations with the Marketer. I have the one and only Nick Shackelford joining us today. Uh, introduction already done beforehand. Um, what I would like to do with you, Nick, is, you know, we know each other um, through occasions at Affiliate World and just chatting in the industry. Um, and I think if anybody's uh, followed you a little bit, they know a little bit of your history and playing in the major leagues with the base of the football and uh, soccer. So I want to kind of dive back into that and just um, try and find out what that tipping point was. And we won't spend too much time on the intro, but I, I do think it's a fascinating story. Yeah. Um, why did you step away from that? And, and what was your entry point to the industry? I know there's a little bit tied in there, I think with Tim Burr potentially, but what was it? Was it just, it wasn't a like foreseeable long-term route or like, why did you step away? Dude, this is a huge question because I, I know when you do like a, a typical talk or a podcast or something, you try to, you like breeze through it. So I'll do my best to give like some of the details. Cause usually I don't want to get into the gritty of why I left. Cause usually you have two reasons when you leave something. You either like, I've conquered something or like you kind of didn't conquer it. So you're like, right. I'm gonna go to the next thing. Well, so I was a goalkeeper and my entire life, like I'm, I'm Orange County born and raised and in Orange County in California is like, it's pretty multicultural and they're gonna mix you with, there's Latinos, there's blacks, there's whites, there's Asians. And when you play sports, like I was, I'm a six foot dude. Like I'm, I'm a solid six foot guy. Um, I'm, I'm more like wide than tall, if you will. Um, and then now it's becoming like larger in the front now, which is unfortunate as a marketer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of the, it is, it is what it is. But at that time I was like, I was really good and I'm a, I'm a left footed guy. So being left footed is unique in that space. It's kind of like left footed or left handed pitcher, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I was, I was known as sort of though, which is like lefty, always lefty hitting with his left, kicking with his left. And I got on a team that was very, very good, but all Hispanic. And yeah. my mom was like, if you want to win championships or if you want to win games, like you need to be on this team. You can play whatever position you want, but you got to go play with those white kids and you're not going to win any games. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to be on the Hispanic team. And I'm going to play whatever position they want me to play, which was goalkeeper. So mm -hmm. 9, 10, 11, um, I started playing goalie. And then I started realizing like, 
oh shit, like I have really good eye hand coordination. Like I have really, I have a good ability of, of confidence. And most kids who are afraid to dive at the ball, right? Their face to the ball. Cause they always tell you, you got to frame your face with your hands and put the face on the ball. And I was just kind of like balls to the wall going for it. it. That, that is what took me like crazy okay, white dude. <laughs> crazy white guy in the net. Go, go. For it. Yeah. Uh, and that, that path basically put me on my, on, on my way. Is like, my sister was really good at, at school. My younger brother was very good at school. And I was like, I, I, I don't want to do school because it was hard for me, but sports and soccer was easy for me. So we consider ourselves what most people like sports poor. We spent all of our money and my family on travel, private training, uh, tryouts, yeah. Olympic development, like you, you name it, we spent our money there. And I realized really early, my mom was like, so 13, 14, 15, when things were like, all right, Shaq, like that's what you're going to do. I was known as, I had multiple nicknames, it was Nico, which was, that's what they called me as uh, the only white on the Latino team. <laughs> of course. Before you met me, like, you met me as Shaq, right? Yeah. So it was Nico, and then I went to the university, which I went to my, my dream school that I wanted, which was Cal Berkeley. Berkeley, the only way I was going to get there is if I played sports, not because of my schooling. Right. As I got in, and I looked in, this was like the first time I started realizing, like in hindsight, you could be the right player in the wrong system and not succeed. Right. And that, and then that's kind of like followed me around everywhere going like, if you are going to be utilized or being, cause you, you're hired at envy level. Like you're hired as a, as a friend, you're hired as a partner, you're hired as a boyfriend, a lover, whatever you're hired as, like you got a job to in a role to, to fulfill or else that relationship's not going to work right. in anything. So I'm, I'm trying to find out, and this is, uh, I'll get to like where I am and why I believe it tied into media buying all the way up to this yeah. point is soccer at that point realized it taught me that you could be in, uh, in a position that you are really, you know, you're, you have confidence in your ability, but you're not being utilized. Right. So I had to make the conscious decision to move to play in Missouri, Missouri for St. Louis university Oh shit! It was okay. where I went from dream school to like, I couldn't even find Missouri on a map, bro. Yeah. <laughs> St. Louis is like gateway, all this stuff. I had no idea. I got very fortunate. I landed with a team called uh, St. Louis. They're called the Billikens, SLU. Go Billikens. Uh, go Bees. They, they used to win all the – it's like us and Santa Clara has like the sea slugs or something. Um, <laughs> and or it's basically like a fat little blue devil. And we got in there. What I didn't realize is a major school, like Pac-12, ACC, um, Big East, like they got football, they got basketball – they got soccer, and then like they start like filling out water polo, all the other things. Sure, sure. Whatever the league that St. Louis was playing within at the time, they didn't have. We had no football. Mm-hmm. We had basketball and we had soccer. Sure. So all the money went to soccer and basketball. Like so, we we were full on Nike, full on field, gorgeous. Everything was gorgeous, and so we walked into a situation where uh, I knew that I had my my skills. I was a California kid. We had a different style about us. Midwest is big boys. They play like bash ball is what we called it. Um, okay. when I, when I walked in there, the goalkeeper that was supposed to start in front of me, his name is Mark Pace, who's still playing today. Um, he actually broke his face. Oh, like, if this is a pole, like dove and smashed his pole and opened the door for me. And I'm like, Oh, shout fuck. out to Mark. Yeah. They, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Oh shit. Like who won? Like he's still playing. I'm now doing marketing. So is he still playing? He is, yeah. He's still he's still crushing it. Um, so that, yeah. that was your that was your open door. That was that was the someone going like, all right, if you want to go get it. And I mean, honestly, it was the rest was history after that. Like, I, I was from freshman on, never never stepped off the field unless I was like, hey, coach, I need to rest my leg or I need right, to rest right. my groin or something. Right. And that decision at that point was right player, right time, right opportunity. Right. Anything could have gone wrong. Coach didn't like my style. We couldn't recruit properly. So I was, I was really in it at that point. And that is where I first started realizing, like, I was always a good leader and on good teams. And the first time I got my earth, sh- like, earth pretty much rattled was when I got to Berkeley. And they're like, yo, it doesn't matter how good you were before. There's so many other good players around you, and you're actually not valuable. And you're like, right. oh. <clears throat> I'm not special. Oh, shit. You're like, fuck, I came from, I'm, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm Nick. Like, I got yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. So that, that routed me. So having St. Louis kind of like propping me back up. And then mm-hmm. through St. Louis, I got introduced to two individuals. One, her name was Annie Castellano, which gave me my first opportunity as an intern at a company called Switch Advertising, who did okay. um, uh, large experiential marketing. 
Um, so uh, out, outside events and like liquor stores boots. or something. Yeah. Boots, like, yeah. You know your favorite thing? I know uh, every time when we go to your uh, AW, AWE or just AW and like the last one, when I walked up for our rehearsals and you're like, dude, this is my favorite part. They're going to raise it up. They're going to raise it up. And you get so juiced up. You're like, so you're going like, they're about to put the big title up. And that's yeah. what they did. And yeah. to see someone craft it, build it and place it. Fuck man. I remember the stage in, in Asia. That shit was, that was special. It's one of my favorite stages. We get the massive AW logo above. We, we get the dollar goes way further in Bangkok. So we get to definitely um, spend more on the customer's experience. So, so your first step in was through experiential marketing though? First step in, I was on, on the creative side, we were working on, so Missouri, the big hub there is Budweiser, right? Okay. So we, we, our main client was Budweiser. And at the time, this is when I started learning about the, the liquor and the, the alcohol world. Bud bought uh, Linen Kugel. Oh, okay. Lin, like Linen Kugel was a, like a craft beer that they bought and they bought one called Blue Moon. Um, so mm. all micro brews, people weren't realizing, but like at that time, maybe, maybe people knew it was new to me, but Bud was buying them. Crazy. And so we were doing like, and then Shock Top was another one. Like those are the three, like I knew. Then Bells and Moon and Shock Tops, yep. Yeah, flat tire, like all these things I was learning. And Bud, we were working on making large scale campaigns for their marketing efforts. And I was sitting there going like, dude, I've only been valued as someone that could like save it and kick it and be strong. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm going like, oh, wait. So I can provide you value by doing thought work. And like, you think there's a price and there's like money that's tied into that. Okay, yeah, cool. Yes. Really important to me. And so that was my first going like, oh shit, my value isn't just sports. My value is like who I am as Nick and who I am as a connector. Okay. Cool. What Which, was that role? What was the role? Like a uh, campaign coordinator or media coordinator or like, what was the role exactly? Camp manager? It's, it's probably on my Facebook right now, but it was literally like creative director, intern, creative uh, marketing support like right, something right, that was, right. it was a genuine college internship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there was there was other than me sitting there taking notes and providing uh, ideation you know yeah. how like internal corporate companies make uh, this is your intern track you're gonna learn a b c that was me i just was filled a seat in the creative side okay cool cool so what were you taking in school is it anything applied or was it just was it like sports management or something or no not at all it was it was actually very applicable and what i kind of do now is um, it's, it was copywriting journalism. Oh, perfect. So nice. I didn't know. Um, I love, I love writing. I, I think my medium, if I could choose, would be writing if I had the time to do so. Mm -hmm. but words are so powerful. Like I, I think in any conversation, I think in, in it, now, now knowing where I am, like 20, what is I'm 29, the words, the ability to like convince someone to do something and have it, take an action on it. Dude, that's how we make our living. Like the, the the ability to communicate in general, whether it's vocal or written word is extremely powerful, whether it's just conversation or it's an outreach on LinkedIn, like it goes across all different levels. It's super, super valuable, obviously. When did you move back to OC? And, and I'm guessing that's when you got tied in. I, I thought you had mentioned one time you were tied in with Tim Bird at one point. No, absolutely. So I, I came back to the Gala Galaxy, graduated in 13, played with the Galaxy 14, 15. Right. And at that point, it was like, she had, I had two decisions, right? And I've been with Shanice for, at this point, I'm with her for 10 Shanice, years. lovely Shanice. <laughs> I'll tell you, say what's up. Um, and at that point, we did, we did long distance. And she was in San Francisco, California, high school sweethearts. And she goes, I was in, I was in Galaxy. I was like, this is my dream. This is the only team I want to play with. Put me on a second team. So, like, I have a contract. I'm locked in. Making, what we're making, like $30,000 a year, $35,000 yeah. a year. And I was driving back and forth in my Prius to, to coach kids for 40 to $50 a pop. Cause I, was, <laughs> I remember I, I, she used to get, we, we joke about it now, but at the time I was like, yo, this is what we have to do. Um, yeah. I was driving from, so I live in Orange County. Uh, I was sleeping at Shanice's mom's place in Orange County uh, in like, there was like six people in the home. And I was, I bought a, uh, I bought a 20, 2009, Prius from David Romney, who is a descendant from the Romney family. Oh and I was, God! <laughs> hey, dude, I need I need this car because I'm driving a lot. And he's like, no problem. Huge trunk and us as yeah, us of as, course. As a coach, I got like two balls of bag, like two bags. Of balls <laughs> of bag. It served my purpose. But there was times where I'd be driving because from Orange County, where we lived, to LA, where I needed to go, Manhattan Beach. 
It's 44, mm-hmm. 44 miles one way. So it's 80 miles back and forth. If I got paid 50 bucks, 20 to 30 of it's going into the tank. Gas money, yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'd come home and be like, babe, like, we, got, we can go wherever you want dollar menu. I got you. I got yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. How, so how, how many years were you doing that? Um, so I did that for, so it was 13, 14, 15. And then end of 16 is right where like, I was like, dude, I'm making no money. I, I went to a private school in Missouri. So I got mm-hmm. debt there. I took out mm-hmm. a, a Stafford loan debt there. Like we're, I'm sitting there going, yes, it's deferred and it's pushing off, but it was a choice of like, do you, you can keep chasing a contract yeah. or you can go like, Hey, like let's double down on what else, you know, that, yeah. that moment Chase is like, we're not doing long distance anymore. So that limited me to California rightfully. Yeah. So that's the right decision. And I go, I go, okay, what do I go next? So I'm coaching kids in California, Mission Viejo area specifically. And there was one mom, her name was Rachel Plepke, who at the time was uh, consumer CPG marketing at PepsiCo. So you have PepsiCo and you have Pepsi. PepsiCo does two, two routes. They can do like what we call the syrup where they're like filling up the stores. Cause okay. it's like the, you plug in the syrup. It's literally just massive bags of syrups or you go on the bottle side. Well, fat, it's like you have fast casual or you have uh, fast food or you have uh, just straight casual or to the different buckets of restaurants that they mm-hmm. would partner with on a quarterly basis. Yep. Well, on those quarterly basis, they like had a, that when I came in as a 90s kid, like true millennial, I was positioning myself as like a millennial consultant. Like, listen, I am the voice of all millennials. Like, listen. <laughs> Classic millennial. <laughs> like, the, vo- the generation of voice. I forgot. I forgot. You're like 42, 45. Oh, come on now. <laughs> when you said you're turning 29, I'm like, fuck you, Shaq. <laughs> <laughs> so, but really, I was like sitting in this room. And you can imagine like me as, as I am now, like I'm actually much more mellow at this point. And back then I was sitting in these meetings with bigger pot belly white guys just going yeah. like, how do we drive revenue? I was like, <laughs> but, like let's do Facebook. I'm like, what does that even mean? So, yeah. I got on three contracts and at this time, this was like the second reaffirmment um, of like, I can make money with my brain and not with my body. Like that was like, okay, number two, I was sitting in two meetings, one specifically with BJ's, BJ's restaurant, which that's a California brand and they, they're famous for the pizzuki and like good pizza. Okay. Uh, it's it's kind of like the, uh, the cheesecake factory. Oh, sure. Yeah. So it's yeah. like the same thing everywhere, right? Yeah. yeah. In Asia, it's cheesecake factory. So BJ's restaurant is the same thing everywhere it goes and they are uh, a large producer of restaurants over here in, in the states at least yep franchise yeah and they were sitting in and it was like one of the one of the initiative was how do we get millennials and bring in their family because we have craft beers and good food so they're like oh like let's think of it a concept so at the time i was pitching i was the voice on pepsi reaffirming agencies that are pitching ideas to do a marketing campaign Right. Okay. So I was hired as like a voice of Pepsi because these were 40, 50, 60 year old men, a couple of women going like, Oh, this is, what should we do? Shaq? What should we do? And <laughs> at that time it was Nicholas, obviously, cause I'm, I'm yeah. professional. I'm buttoned up. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> no hoodies at that time. No. And I sat there and I was like, Oh shit. The first contract we signed, uh, one creative agency was like, okay, I think we should do this $50,000 activation. Um, and I think we should roll it off for the next like two months. And I was like, these guys are gonna get 50 grand for doing one idea for five. And I was just sitting here trying to do this math. I'm like, what the fuck How is this happening? Yeah. I sit there and ask Rachel, I was like, Rachel, like I'm, I'm contemplating, like, what do I do? Like, I'm obviously providing value for Pepsi. Where do I go? Mm-hmm. It was like, unfortunately, like the only place that you can go to, to integrate in is New York. And I was like, I can't, I can't no, That's long distance again. Check, sit your butt down. Yeah. Uh, so I, she introduced me to the next and then, then enters like that's Facebook on organic social, like learning how to position it. And then she goes, well, let me call my, my, uh, her niece at the time. Her, her name is Alison Fulleron. Alison Fulleron was my first entry point into fa- Facebook paid media. And yeah. that was for probably the biggest and sexiest brand I've ever worked with was Apple. So in LA, there's an agency called Mal Media Arts Lab. It's right next to like, it's called Playa Vista or Silicon Beach is what they uh, name it now. And they were building out uh, under a team called Resolution Media, which is an Omnicom owned agency, large agency, wow. right? Yeah. Warner Brothers, Car, Ford, Nissan, that shit. 
and they go, well, Apple got a contract and that, that time there was a large initiative from Tim Cook. And we're like, we're digital, we're digital. We got to go digital. Like they were, they were always billboards and they were always TV, but they started reframing TV spots, chopping it and running on social. So we'd be sitting there and we'd be all in one room. So we get an initiative from uh, search because obviously search for Apple is large because everyone's doing <coughs> it. And they were like, Hey, we have the iPhone seven launch. We have the iPad pro. We have the iWatch. And like, those are the three campaigns in 2017 where I was like, I was in that shit, bro. I'll tell you a story. Like as soon as I get to it, but it's, I've never been more scared. And this is when I realized like client, agency relationships like the only thing that you have you have to produce results but yep. like knowing your person like knowing your counterpart is so valuable right um i was sitting in there and we were we were spending budgets to the point where i think people back in 2016 2017 you would remember this you could type in in like a reach of frequency campaign or like how many how many people you want to reach you can like fuck with how much money you would spend <laughs> like what your reach would be we were basically uh i was in charge of apac and eu and so okay. I was having to target these countries and I'd be sitting there going like, all right, I was on, I think we need 450,000 and we can get. <laughs> and she's like, all right, put in the media plan. I'm like, okay. Oh my God. Like, what a freaking level to be integrated into the industry at. It's, it, I mean, it, it's uh, it probably does you a service and a disservice being able to be exposed to such large budgets right out the gate. And then, you know, for your own for structured social going in as agency where, you know, you can be a little bit, you try to qualify leads coming in clients coming in, but no budgets close to that right out the gate. It's not even like the budget size. It's, it is the budget size and it's the, we don't give a fuck about return. Yeah. Yeah. That That's the, a, that's the, the old mentality. So we, we, so and I think you're kind of getting to it is like, okay, that indoctrined myself into, first of all, it shattered all beliefs. I'd never seen money. Dude, I'm, uh, I'm a middle child of three in yeah. a divorced family in Orange County where dad is a, an air conditioned uh, HVAC guy. My mom did mm -hmm. front office and dental work. Like I was destined for a solid 50 K <laughs> salary, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was, I was right. I was like ready to make, and I was happy with the scraps I was getting coaching. Um, yeah. And I was like, learning how to be thankful for what, what we were in. And so the mm -hmm. first, like, so you just want me to keep adding these zeros? Like I was, dude, it's scary. Like, and, and people, if you, you'd ask me like, what makes a good media buyer? I go, dude, if you're, if you have the ability to spend money and like close your computer, like you're a good buyer, walk right? Away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have that confidence and you're like, Oh, it's not going to break. Or worst case, I spent a couple grand. Um, right. That, that was hard. I learned that real early. And so why, why I had to move away from Apple was because, First of all, it's huge. There's a huge people. There was like 13 people on the team who, how much value. And up to this point, I was a goalkeeper. I was at mm -hmm. major leading company or major leading teams. And I was, mm -hmm. relying on. Mm -hmm. so going into like finding out who you are, I like to be dependent upon. I like to be, it's the same thing when you call it like, Hey, like, hey, do, like, what are, what are we going to do? I give me a new piece of content. You're going to talk about on stage. I was like, Oh, do I, I told you, I was like, no, I don't have time. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I told you no. And you're like, but what about, what if? And I was like, oh yeah, what if? And then I did, <laughs> like, I like that. I like being dependent yeah. upon. And, and I go, okay, I'm finding myself unhappy because I'm not leading or I'm not a, a leader in a position. And people could say like, hey, you should have put more time in. I was like, yeah, fair enough. Maybe, maybe if I would have grinded harder, um, it yeah. would have been ex accentuated. Enter in my partner. Like up until this point, uh, nobody has talked about my partner and he's still pretty silent on everything I do. Wait, I think I found out who it is. John Hagen. <laughs> no, John. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad you got me there. John Hagen was because of my partner, Jake Schmidt. Okay. Yeah. I was talking with John. I can't remember. It was like a few months ago. I just came to me, uh, that he said he worked, uh, structured with you campaign management or something. He was brother. He was probably like our he second. We had, we hired his brother, Alex first taught Alex media buying. Alex yeah. said, I'm in corporate. I'm like, good luck. Uh, <laughs> then, he, then he brings his brother, John, and like, John just grinded with us. So like, we moved yeah. him to LA. Uh, we put him in a house in Inglewood. It was like, dude, it's so. Classy move. <laughs> <laughs> Want to work for us? We got you a place in Inglewood. Yeah, and John's like, cornbread boy from Missouri. Hard <laughs> cornbread boy from Missouri. It was he, fun. he was there for uh, Fidgetly, right? Like, I think he mentioned that he was part of that. He was at the end, he was towards the end of it because mm. here's. 
what happened with Fidgely was, so we have to, we have to cover back. So J- enter and Jake Schmidt. So Jake is actually from Missouri. So we have another weird tie there, but we never knew each other. Okay. So as soon as I, I left, I got introduced from a mutual friend. His name was Tony Ock. And Jake is, I think, five, five years younger than me, five, six years younger than me, between those ranges. And at the time I met him, he was like slinging soccer jerseys. He's a goalkeeper. So it's just like these things, these things didn't make any sense. I was like, dude, you have to be in my life. And yeah. you could ask him today. I was like, I was consistently like hitting him up because I was, I was bored. I knew Facebook. I was like, dude, what are you up to? Like, how can I help? Um, let's do influencer stuff, like growing accounts. And he goes, he goes, oh, I got this cool product. I think it'll work. And then he enters in, like enter in fidgety, yeah. right? <laughs> nice. So he, Jake has a brilliant idea of like, oh, this will, this will go crazy. Like, let's go viral. I was like, oh, let's, let's do it. I'll run some ads. And even if I, I still have access to the account today, it's like $2 conversions on a $35 product. So I'm like, okay, I know Facebook. I never, I never saw or touched the money. Then we took off. Mm-hmm. And then I go like, oh, shit, this is what we need to do. Like, I need performance. Right at that time started, Shanice opens up her, her clothing store, Brick Market Boutique. Right, right. So now we don't have to necessarily rely, and she was working, grinding her ass off, but I had a little bit of cover to like make up my mind and make a decision. Mm-hmm. So I remember as soon as she got up and running, I was like, okay, cool, stability is here. Um, and Jake and I was like, let's just work on something. How do we, we're just trying to get money from somebody. Who will pay us? We start scaling fidgetly. I, I fly Jake out to San Diego. We meet at Traffic and Conversion. We drive up to LA to meet a partner of ours to help us fund or give us some mm-hmm. money to, to get inventory because that was our issue. It was like, yo, we don't know what to do. We're marketing, like help us. Yeah. Um, that's when I fell out of love of building a product. So people always ask, well, if you're so good at building brands, like why don't you have your own? We do, but I don't like product development or customer service or any of that shit. I like okay. the other, that's like the car code answer. Jake loves the customer service, loves the processes, loves operations. That's where he loves to excel at. He loves building. Perfect. I love, I love accentuating or scaling. So yeah. he, he and I have a great relationship. Jake stays in LA. He's currently yeah. still in LA. And I go, dude, I, I, I need to go see if I, like I scaled fidgetly. I need to go see if I can do this again. Yeah. Enter Tim Bird, right? Okay. Tim Bird posts in Facebook advisor. And at that point, I'm just lurking and finding out. And this is like the beginning of the reputation build. Mess- yeah. Every single day, if someone asks me like, oh, how did you like build what, like a reputation or the skills you have? Bro, every single day, I was like posting and talking and commenting in every channel, whether it's Facebook ad buyers, e-com empires. I was trying my best to have that name everywhere. Two reasons. Shackleford is a reputable name. Like, that's a strong <clears throat> name. You're not going to forget it. So I was like, let's get my name everywhere. And it's long as fuck. So I go, okay, keep posting. All of a sudden, Tim posts like, hey, I, this is a, he has a media buyer quiz to like, judge your value because he was trying to scale agency why yeah so I, I i take the test i go dude i got like a 99 on it i got like one wrong what do you can i can i meet you he's an yeah. irvine to find out i was like oh yeah. shit so i come to tim and i was like dude i promise you i got skills like just like take me like just let me do something right yeah. i sit there and i open my i open my ad account and i show fidgetly and he goes like at this point we didn't really know like a universal naming convention like uh order like just how clean and ordered it is I open, I show it. I'm already like that because that, that's how my brain kind of operates. And he looks at me and goes like, oh, you, you definitely know what you're doing. Like I can see, obviously, you know how to scale. I, I see that you know how to label your conversions. But I didn't know mm-hmm. reporting. I didn't know like other tactics. And at the time, like this, the reason why Tim has been so successful for so long is because he has so much fucking access. He has so much access. And at the time, I, I, during 17, a little bit of 18, he was, he had so many brands like inundated, bro. I would used to sit next to him at agency Y and just across the bottom, he had a wide screen across the bottom message, 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 45 conversations at a time. I'm like, dude, how do you live? Like, what is this? And I only knew that if I was going to get better, I had to be right next to this guy. Right. 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 And so I stayed with Tim for, I think it was like seven, eight months learning like, hardcore learning, taking on as many brands. And that's where, uh, media buying, scaling, like page Recording. development. Yeah. You name it, like that was like crash course. Here's how we do it. Mm-hmm. And Tim had the opportunity to, to like shop agency Y around or, or push it somewhere to like grow and get more resources. Yep. And you're in like, I can't move anywhere. 
So he ended up moving or, or partnering up with DFO, which took yeah. everybody to San Diego. Yeah. Can't, can't go that, can't do it. So I, I was like, okay, I know media buying, but I wasn't working on like legitimate or, or long-term or big brands. Like no brands that I could put, um, or uh, w- one brand I, I, I still work with from that, uh, but he's pivoted multiple times because that was more like drop shipping, take advantage of like the early offers, right? Yeah. Enter Common Thread. Common Thread comes in and they go, they are building, uh, a, Taylor's building a, a beautiful community over here in, in Santa Ana, Irvine. And he goes, hey, just come in and just impress me with something. So I sat down one day and I, I showed him existing post studies. I said, I was like, oh, you cut and cut and paste. You can share social proof and like you can scale. And then I remember sitting there and he's like, I haven't really talked to somebody in a minute that like taught me some shit and like you taught me some shit. And I was like, I was like, all right, here we go. Like, let's, let's go for this Yeah. month over month, like home run, like largest billable, largest billable. The whole company just started growing, growing, growing. I think when I left 85 people, just a beast. Wait, what did it, what did it start at? I think I walked in at 9, 10, 11, like 9, 10, 11 people. Holy crap. But it was, it was all like a side. I remember it was like in the building that they're currently in, we were in a smaller building of the larger building. That's how small. Uh, okay. Yeah, I remember seeing uh, inside uh, some of the videos that you guys had. It looked like a really cool space where you guys held uh, like information series or yeah. know, some video. Yeah, I think you invited Shopify in or Facebook. It's huge. It's like a, yeah. it's a legitimate warehouse. But it, what you didn't see was like right right at the beginning is like a room of one, two, like three rooms in a common room area, yeah. and that was it? Like that was because yeah. it wasn't big yet. And so, so wait, so for to get to that size, like what was your involvement on scaling the agency, or were were, were you taking the new team members underneath of you, training the media buyers up, or what, what was your involvement with growing it? Yeah, so I think my main contributor was the fact that we, I scaled uh, Diff Eyewear with our team. Um, and then we scaled Pup Socks was the next one. So those two were massive case studies that went viral, right? Yeah. And yeah. As, as I was very in on the, the business development side of, hey, I, knew, I myself knew how to run media. So everybody on our team, which was shout out to Vincent Wu, Adriana, Adrienne, Ali, Trent, um, Savannah? Savannah was, as a company grew, Savannah was overseeing media buyers. Amazing. Uh, I, I was managing like people that bought, like we were like just buying our, we did a pod system, right? So okay. our pod, we called ourselves 3TC because we were the third team, third time's a charm. Beautiful. Nice. You know, like I, will, I will own that. Like that was, <laughs> that was me for sure. And it was, dude, it was like, it was how I wish it was now, but they got, they're, they're big. Like, we had four teams and we were bidding on clients. Like we would be like, Hey, we'd come as a team and be like, all right, I really want this brand. This one, one brand called Alcam. Alcam, they were like a venture back team. This dude flew into us. He's like, it's like the weekend of Super Bowl. He goes, Hey, we got a couple hundred thousand dollars to spend. Like who wants it? And me and my boy Vince, who I, I love this guy to death. Uh, Adrian too. Adrian was like, the, the reason why I was successful were like three people, Caitlin, uh, Adrian and Vince and these, two, these three people were like so instrumental the way I worked and the way I was able to communicate and the way I was able to like go so aggressive that mm-hmm. I was basically running and throwing the shit behind me and they're like orderly. Thank you. That paper. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're like, just keep running Shaq. Like we'll, we'll, we'll catch up to you. Um, and we were, we were bidding on like brands. So back to the out thing it was like, I told Vince, I was like, listen, it's gonna be a grind, but like, we're gonna, we're gonna make a boatload of money and we're gonna, we're gonna run for it. We're gonna do this. And so that attitude of who wants this brand, like it was so competitive. And I brought that nature with playing sports because performance marketing, like we're mental athletes. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, you got to treat your body right. You got to eat right. You got to, uh, as I have Chick-fil-A right here. Um, uh, and as that last time I made my own, like, I know it looks so good. <laughs> um, but it, it was, dude, it was a game. And so Taylor like saw that he was like, Shaq, just like, just, just don't break shit. Just like keep moving, keep working. And through, scaling multiple brands, like the energy, when you instill like energy into people because you're just wanting to go as fast as you can, like mm-hmm. dude, that, that, re- that reverberates, right? Like mm-hmm. you don't have either, it tur- you turns you on or turns you off. Yep. And, and thankfully with the ecosystem that Taylor was building and uh, Jordan Palmer and the, the three other partners, like they made a community that allowed me specifically to grow my name, 
their reputation right. and their billables. Yeah. Plain I want to, uh, I want to ask you about how, um, you went after these clients. So you were putting bids out to specific brands. Was that your main method for business development or did you have other funnels in place? Like how did, how did you guys get most of your clients? Was it through bidding? So I'll, I'll revert back to that. So bidding was an internal thing. Leads, leads were coming into us, us as the internal team were like, do you want that? Do you want that brand? So, I see. I see. But I'll, 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 we'll answer your overarching question. So we, we used at the time two main ways. Um, you have Sumo, which is like sumo.com where you can post articles and then yep. Lean Lux. So I know, I know for a fact we did like a media buy in Lean Lux, which was like a news, uh, news publication. Now there's right. other, this one's like 2 PM. 2 PM is yep. a really good community uh, on the e-commerce side. And so we just started getting featured and Taylor was like always forward thinking about, Hey, like we got to get our, we're doing some cool shit here. We got to talk about that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he was very loud as well as I was on socials. Like, bro, I've been, I've been building and, and writing and doing as much as videos as I can. And so yep. that started having its own inbound. Plus you start having case studies of four X <clears throat> mil diff for a uh, two seventy five in two days. Like people are going to come for that for sure. Yeah. When you, when you finish with a client or a client's work, how does the NDA work with doing the case studies? Like, they pretty are most of the clients pretty open to you sharing those kind of that kind of information. We have a line item in at least in my so my current structure social contract. We have a line item that says like we won't specifically share actual number like we won't share detailed numbers, but yeah. we will talk about what we did and the overall growth. Yeah. Okay. For your brand, okay. we won't go like they started with two thousand dollar budget. We got we can't do that. We it's. Yeah. A, and I actually got a question today from Phil from Gorgeous. He was like, hey, I have an opportunity for you. Can you send me case studies? And I was like, I'm not going to send you any case studies because I, I don't believe, I believe case studies is a form of false advertising because it's going to showcase all the things that went right. And yeah. the brand, usually the brand we're getting has things that aren't right. It's such a fucking shack thing. You've gotten to a point where you're like, nah, I'm not going to give you a case study. No, 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 no. Like, I'll do, I'll do a Must be case. nice, man. Must be. No, I'm just kidding. I'm messing with you. Um, I got you. It, it is, it is kind of like a, oh, get off your pedestal, bro. It's a little bit of a flex, though. Like, if I heard that, I'd be like, damn, I want to work with them even more. Nah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, and I, I know how that landed. I know, and I know how that's perceived. <laughs> I, know how that's perceived. I get it. But it's more of like, Truthfully, a case study highlights all things that went right, right? All mm -hmm. things that that brand, when at the end of the day, like you should hire a partner or an agency that is able to clearly articulate what had happened, what mm -hmm. is happening and what's mm -hmm. going to happen. Yeah. Almost disclaimers should be attached to it. Yeah. Dude, you'd be like, Hey, this is 4X. I remember dude, when we, when we were getting case studies for Pup Socks, the amount of fucking dog brands that came to us were like, so when are we going to get that million, huh? Mm -hmm. I was like, do you know what Zach had to do? Like, we were on a fucking phone call with Amex and Facebook. And we're like, can you guys understand that we need more money? Like, we <laughs> that doesn't happen, dude. Yeah. So we, and so just to go back to that overarching question, I was, I was trying to get at for, for a common thread. Um, so you, it sounds like the leads were coming through because you're building out your personal brand. You guys did ad buys, particular publications, online publications. Um, what did you guys have us? Sorry. Jordan Palmer was, uh, Matt, so we're, we're orange County, right? We're, yeah. we're 45 from LA and we're 45 from San Diego. Right. I think, I think location of where we were was huge. Why do you think V6 is how, as big as they are? Mm -hmm. Part of, heart of LA. Yeah. Part of LA. Yeah. yeah. They have the most case studies uh, that known to man because they have great relationships, but yeah. we, were getting, we were getting leads because we were putting on quality content. Check. Jordan Palmer was an absolute beast on his reputation as uh, that was like our unique side. Like you can't beat that. Like he, he, yeah. is, he is Taylor as an individual as like a leading force myself as a force. Like we were very special. Like that's a, that's a special team. I just got done watching uh, Jordan and Pippin, right? Like, mm -hmm. I need to start that. It looks so good. I, I felt like Jor Taylor was Michael Jordan, and him yeah. being like, what was he like thirties, like old man shit? Like yeah. I was coming up, like, all right, let me go, let me like, let me continue to push. And I even, love that. Yeah. Even to this day, like when I had when I left, I sat there, I was like, oh shit, like this is. I cried my eyes out when I left, and they did like a, a pretty nice ceremony going away. And yeah. I looked back, and I was like, even to this, like Taylor and I. I thought leaving Taylor and I would be like, 
good like oh like i got you like keep working together but it turned into like hey i love you but i recognize you and i see you like you're a competitor right now oh shit like, it's like hey i love you i got respect for you i vibe with you i get it but like you're we're competing yeah and so yeah I was like, I, I, I mean, that's almost like the finishing touch where, you know, you've been, you've, uh, it's not surpassing, but you've become a peer. So, I mean, what better way to be in position? I'm sure you guys still have somewhat of a good relationship, sure. but yeah, yeah. It yeah, seems yeah. like a good. I think in this world, it's like the last thing you want is, is bad blood. And it, there's, I, I, it's in my Twitter bio. I was like, I, I believe I'm living a life to show that there's enough for everyone to go around. Like, I, yeah. I really believe that. I really believe yeah. that in our world bro it's it's a world it's a worldwide economy now more than ever mm -hmm. that if someone wants to work with you they're gonna find a way yeah that's similar to uh ezra's tagline somewhat it's serve unselfishly and profit okay. and i think actually uh ricky who uh had reached out for a quote and i give him something but it was a base along the lines of generosity is the most important thing that we could be doing right now uh yeah. the, the industry has come out from under the shadows. And I think we can all be a little bit more public with what we're doing now. Everything should be a bit more above board because obviously there's ways to take advantages of the systems and stuff, but it's getting harder and harder. And more people are realizing you need to do long-term businesses. And in that sense, you can be much more um, transparent with what you're doing. And I think, and it propels the, the industry forward. The faster we can learn and break things and get more budgets away from, from uh, traditional agencies, the better for everyone. Topher Grant is a huge advocate for that. So totally understand where you come from. And I love, I love how much you do give to the industry. I think it's pretty clear. You're one of those figures, you know, like D, um, Tim too. Um, there are just individuals that share, share, share. And this clearly is part of your sales model too, like because you're getting leads off of it. Would you say for agencies, um, if they aren't doing case studies, or if they don't have a public profile of showcasing that as content, they're missing. That's like they're missing out on a lot of opportunities. Or like, is this a staple every agency should be doing? In terms of like creating case studies or being out, out? Yeah, I think case studies and having a public figure to yes. uh, for people to get connected with. A lot of agencies aren't doing that. Um, but I mean, is think, it? Think about agencies or products. Like a guy that does this incredibly, Dim Nico. Absolutely. He came crashing out of the I remember he was over. He, I bought him on stage for Affiliate World Asia 2018. First speaker, I put him on day one, first speaker. Uh, he'd been building up his name in the scene and I threw him right into the deep end. He comes out on stage and he already briefed me on what he was gonna do. Uh, he comes out on stage, puts a Snapchat picture on behind him and he looks at the, looks at the crowd, looks behind him because he says, I guess Snapchat isn't only used for dick pics or something like that. And it was just like, we were a little confused, but then they liked it. And you know how hard it is to get a little bit of a laughter out of the audience sometimes, but he has just come onto the scene in such a big way. And he's another one of those guys that just shares, shares, shares really technical in length um, content. It's incredible. And he's such a young kid too, not to say kid, but he's, he's doing so much at uh, such a young age. It's uh, lighting the fire under some of the old dogs. Oh, I get, this is this is what's needed though. Like you, you mentioned Topher. Topher and I literally sat down with each other and did. The, it's on YouTube of like for different agency models, right? Like a performance model versus a retainer model. Mm -hmm. um, great, great talk. He, he and I went in on in I think uh, Barcelona. I, fuck, it was, it was Barcelona. And yeah. I, I, what I, what I really, really firmly believe in this is like when you start, you talked about transparency, right? In anything, if someone understands what you're about or where you're coming from, they know how to better receive you. So if you're coming and you're like, oh, I'm going to hide everything, and then all of a sudden they get hit, you're like, whoa, where does this come from? But in your mind, you're like, oh, I've been trying to lay this up for a long time, and yeah. they're blindsided. People don't like not knowing. Like, as soon as, think about it, go sit there and be like, tell a secret, everybody around is going to be like, what are you guys talking about? Like, why are you not, what are you doing? So if you can show what's happening, there's no secrets. Like, for us and our team, we have, across email and paid social, we have 110 brands. Holy shit. Okay. I didn't know you had that many brands. We're, 20, we're 22 people right now. Right? I was going to ask you what your, your team structure was looking at, looking uh, like. I, I didn't know it was 22 either. I was thinking around the 10 mark, but. Bro, we're, bu we're, we're building. Like, or we, have, we have, there's three elements to the business. We have, and obviously this is built, we have Geekout Education, right? Mm -hmm. That's James leading that with me. We have Structure Social, 
which is Jake, and we have two new partners that we're going to announce once quarantine slows down. And yeah. then we have Constant Creative, which is performance marketing creative. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, like, we're ins- I'm insulating this to a point where we, we, know, we, know, we know how to buy media. Very fucking good at buying media. Okay? But guess what's really difficult? Buying media. Very difficult <laughs> buying media. So what's not as difficult is email. So what yeah. we had to do is we had to make a nice, nice little partnership, nice little acquisition on an email side. Okay. okay? So then once you, once you have that insulated, variables happen on paid media right now. Like we have one brand, well, I literally have it up. $22,000 in spend. $22,000 in spend. Yesterday, they spent $9,000. Okay. So now you have, a, you have massive variable for no fucking reason. Like, okay, yeah. why, why is this happening? We're in, we're in April quarantine. So that, that provides massive upside, but also if their supply chain breaks or they get COVID in their factory, that goes to zero. Yep. Email. Steady, steady as she goes. Yeah. Steady as she goes. So I knew, and then, then we go, wait. So we've, I've been doing this agency in this world for like six and a half years. Like let's just start building in time so that I can start analyzing what, what creative is working and why it's working. Mm-hmm. When, you have, when you have offers like Design Pickle and, and No Limit and you have these guys that are creating content that it's, beautiful, beautiful content consistently, but they in their core aren't buyers. Like content converts. And I did this on the last talk at AWA, right? Good, good response. Great response from people going like, Oh shit, that's how you look at that. Okay. That makes sense. That that's, it's a recipe. There's a, there's a bunch of these like, all right. So I'm looking at all my brands. Um, and then these seem like they're working consistently at top of funnel. Okay. How do we make more variations of this? Just rotate out a couple of, uh, first two, two or three seconds. Then you start sharing that with people and now everyone's able to create performance. Now everyone's able to provide for their business. So this is constant creative now that you're outlining. Correct. Yeah. So that yeah. is like, it all feeds itself. Education for learning of all the industries, yeah. paid media so that we can actually talk the talk and walk the walk yeah. and yeah. the content we can create that we're not held responsible other than like, if we create good content, they stay. If they don't, they leave. I like it, you know, the way that you've insulated it. So you're keeping more of the money within the parent company of yours and rotating between the businesses, right? Yeah. Basically. It's the same. I think where people get, get lost at stability and like, I guess like true North is when mm-hmm. you have conflicting things. Like I'm not starting a shoe company and I'm not doing um, a course. Like I'm doing content that feeds and it's from the designers for the agency and then all the things that we do is educational and disseminating to those that want to learn it. So it's, it's all the same thing. It's like, Hey, I'm already doing this. It just has to kind of like shift a little bit, just content, just media buying and just education. I hear you all too well. Um, yeah. iStack is uh, launching iStack labs agency. It should it probably is going to launch before this episode airs, uh, but it's to service the, the industry, not so much um, the broader uh, like e-commerce industries a little bit, but uh, more so some of the close relationships that they have with networks, traffic sources, um, yeah, affiliates even. But it's keeping it within the ecosystem because, like, if you know if you know an industry extremely well and you have the skills to apply it, might as well pair it if it's if it's within the ecosystem. Yeah. No, it's 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 your duty. Like you have a it's your you duty. A, you have a duty. Well, what, I mean, that's the thing. Like, who better else to do it really? Yeah. Right. I'm, uh, I'm curious about, uh, constant creative. So I, I, you, you mentioned it before the call. Has it launched yet? What stage is it at? It's funny. You said this. It was on my slides at AWA. Really? Oh fuck. I thought I keep getting mixed up with another company that I used to work at, uh, revenue Wire. the one I was referencing with constant content. I keep getting mixed up. Um, no, you're, so, so it's, it's been very subtle. Like let, let's, let's like very much highlight this is, we, we basically are, are the, the term like dog fooding, like we're feeding ourselves, we're feeding those with the same product that we're eating. Like we are, we are using our designers. So it's literally like we have, I think 12 brands with us and it's because it's me and Jake closing on the phone and us going like, all right, like it's me, Jake, my creative director, my yeah. project manager and all of our designers in the, in the Slack channel communicating, going like, Okay, like, what do you want? Okay, let's let's see if we can make that creative. And then we go to our designers, like, hey, we need to make this creative. And so we're trying to build out the model, and it's working. You're all in the same Slack channel together. Doesn't that get messy? Uh, no. If it, if you stay in your lane, no. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So some people like the, there's certain there's certain keywords that as soon as it's done, like Zapier, Asana, Slack, 
Google Sheets, and then as soon as we build out a custom solution, we'll all integrate in. We won't have to use Slack. But yeah. when you when you in include Slack into it, what, from my personal experience versus a Zoom call, like this is somewhat formal. And mm -hmm. when you're in Slack communication, I believe that you can create a, a team wide experience. And most of the brands we're working with is in Slack. So if we have a shared channel in their own business, we're a part of your team. Mm -hmm. If we're a part of your team, the likelihood of you, and it's a retention play, the likelihood of you wanting to get rid of me on your team is, is a little bit less, I'm assuming, right? Like that's my play is yeah. if you see me and we're your designer in your group, Hey guys need some new ads. Yeah. So I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to use it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you're, it's a very good insight. You're right. If, if, if you're part of a Slack channel, you feel like a loose arm of the company that you're, that you're contracted from. It's exactly. a nice play. I like that. If there is an underlying tone, I think that's, yeah, I mean, for ISEC labs, I think that they're setting it up that way as well. How many, so how do you structure it for yourself? Like, was it like a design, a dev or HQ or something like that? So we have, Per brand, one, we have one brand for one channel, and then we have all forms within that channel. As soon as someone does a request or has comments, it'll do a zap into uh, ClickUp. ClickUp will then set up a bunch of triggers so that we can communicate to designers and get edits moving. As soon as that's done, it'll spit back through ClickUp, and they'll be able to make direct edits on the creative. I love it. <laughs> it's a work of art hey um I, w I wanted to ask you had mentioned earlier you uh, you didn't want to run it for your own products because you didn't like the, the one side of the business but then your partner came in how many of the products do you do equity deals with or do you own or they like have you wavered on either side i kind of imagine that you would have had some kind of either equity deal with a lot of the clients so i only did i've only done one equity deal it's called uh, miracle brand uh, one of one of my favorite favorite videos, which we showed at, on stage, yeah. uh, silver sheets, silver and linen sheets, and it's I, dude, it's a great question. Like I, I don't know, I don't have a real reason why I'm not doing it. I have two really really close friends that love doing it that way, and they're actually producing more revenue because it's a rev share. Mm. I just didn't set the model up like that. Like I, I'm not against it, but I know now. I wouldn't want to take equity in a brand and get paid less for the growth that they're about to have. And then only own like a smaller percentage, but then that's just like me making an excuse of yeah. not taking a risk. So I, I really, I don't know. Well, so how about, uh, I mean, starting more of your own brands from the ground up, like, or are you just like, you, you don't miss that, what that side of the business or what's, what's the roadblocks there for you? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's still about, it's still in the same feeling of why like, I don't want to do fidgety anymore is, or why I didn't like doing Fidgetly was because I didn't want to deal with the fulfillment, the shipping, the stopping, like mm -hmm. the, the only no's that I get right now is like, Hey, we have no more inventory. That product stops selling it. Right. <laughs> Versus like, Oh, I now have to worry about my customer support and my page. Yeah. Going down. Like, yeah. just, although I, it's choose your problems, right? For sure. It's, choose, choose your different problems. And I think if I, I personally, like right now where I stand, there's not a niche or a product or an industry where I'm like, I really want to do more of that. And I have one, I, I've had three brands. We've had Fidgetly, um, we've had Miracle, and then we had my very, very first one, which was Keep Air, which is goalkeeper gloves out of Canada. Nice one. It's, it's, it's over here somewhere. Behind the Chick-fil-A. It, it <laughs> um, and that, that was a special project to me because it's goalkeeping and it's yeah. Canada, so it was a nice marriage. But mm -hmm. I think... Phase, I, I would say, whatever, I mean, like phase four of Shackleford, but like phase five might be just portfolio brands, right? Like, yeah. we, what's the hardest thing to do? Run paid traffic and media and email. And like, we already kind of have that. So now I'm hoping once we find the products that we want, we just kind of run it through the system yeah. and make it work. So focus on the processes first. And then once you get it to an easy dialed in solution, then start integrating maybe your own products. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think yeah. Jake and I were talking about it. He's like, what about, should we do it right now? Is now the time? And I was like, dude, like structure's working, constant's working, geek out's working. Jake has his own brand. Um, I, I, we're trying to integrate with the, the, the team we just acquired. So like, there's a lot of shit we have to figure out. And so, I mean, just to that point though, now is the time. Now is the weirdest time, to be honest. Like we're seeing, I mean, Shopify has said that they're seeing Black Friday dailies instead of that 
annual time of the year. People are saying that, you know, all they need to do is get more budget from advertisers to double. Um, you have just, you just referenced the, the variables at play and how the, um, your one account that you just brought up uh, had doubled in spend in a day and it could be gone tomorrow. What I know that you've spoken about a little bit, but, and apologies to the, to the audience if there's a little bit of repetition, but um, what are you seeing in like, it's, are you seeing the same, are, I'm, I'm guessing you're seeing the same numbers and Shopify has publicly announced that. Um, what's your take? Personally, we, we, so I have three opinions on this. One, I'm not going to be like overly excited because I believe it can go as down as fast as it's gone up. Um, we've been very fortunate on the products and brands that we partnered with that we're essential or essential plus. Mm -hmm. What that means is we didn't choose luxury. We didn't choose uh, high-end bikini. We didn't choose travel. We didn't choose bags. Like mm -hmm. the, all the brands that we currently have, out of all of them, the only one, the only one we have that's not working is an event business and it's on the email side. Jeez. So okay. we, I'm, 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 and I'm, I, you're fortunate. Yeah. Thank the Lord. I, I thank the Lord every single day. And I tell my team this, I'm like, right now we have a, we have, ob, we have an obligation because we are in a position where we're not struggling. Everyone's job is safe. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? F fucking work, like work even harder because right now is the time to be like, Hey, uh, the amount of lists I have on my desk of people who are out of work quality. I know. Quality. I know. Yeah. So I go, I see here in at the across the partners. We go, it's so-and-so how so-and-so working and they, they're providing value. Like how do you like them as a team? Because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people that we can like rotate in as sad as that sounds. And as I'm not trying to be scared, but like that shit's real. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. The amount of talent that's on the market right now. And, and I, we, I was on a, I was on a call today with, 13 corporate bankers, investors, and um, private, ec private equity firms. That was like, we did a breakfast, uh, breakfast of champions, they call it. Oh, and nice, I nice. I was on a call with Moise yesterday, and he said that he started that uh, similar format in uh, Silicon Valley. It's needed. It's, it's, I, I, I'm sitting here going like, I'm, I'm flying the wall, like listening in, because obviously I have a pulse of consumerism, and these guys are talking about pulses of, like the topic was oil and topic of- uh, <laughs> You're just like, ooh. That's a, it's a, I'm, I'm <laughs> so they, they were sitting there going like, we haven't even begun to see like furloughs. Like they, they think they, they got through that first month and then mm -hmm. the PPP checks have stopped. Like the amount of people that actually applied for these and didn't get them is grossly understated, grossly understated. And I, and I have no, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. I'm not speaking as a, as if I know I'm speaking on what these intelligent individuals are telling me. And I'm mm -hmm. going like, we're like, holy shit. Like I have never been more thankful to be a completely diversified digital team in my life yeah. and not having to worry about that because right now cash flow is king. So if, if you're, if you're one of these large, large teams that are going like, ah, uh, you know what? We're going to make it through this. Russell, uh, what is it? Branson has to sell Necker Island. No, I didn't see that. <laughs> I heard Branson was asking for a $500 million bailout and they're like, dude, what do you want? Like go sell your Island. Like, so I think he's selling his Island. Holy crap. So, I'm sitting going like if these guys, if these big, 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 big companies of like 300, 400, 500 people yeah. are on the brink of just updating how many people are going to get fired. Also on like in, in continuous them, the reason why people aren't like the, the unemployment numbers aren't as high is because they're saying that that's as much as they were able to produce. You're kidding me. So it wasn't, it wasn't the, that re it, the reporting stopped. <laughs> they're like, we couldn't get through more. So there's still more stuff to be updated. We just haven't had it yet. Oh, man. As, as dreary as that sounds for us in our position. It's reality. Yeah. In our, but in our lives, like, brother, we are so positioned to drive revenue. We're so positioned to sell online because mm. you have, and this was another perspective that was driven into me early. So large, and specifically in America, we have a large religious following, right? We have a large, yeah. uh, large denominations across the world. Yeah. Sorry, across the states, not the world. I'm sure, yes, around the world, but states. The, the first time they had to go online, the uh, first time that a lot of these individuals that are older or just like don't take the technology a little quicker is to continue to listen to the, the word, the, the, the spoken word through church online. So you have a lot of consumers that used to go in person looking for community. You're kidding me. 
So now, now, now stay with me. Now they're having to join online to listen to these, to the, the teachings or the words of the Lord. Yeah. And then how, how else are they giving donations? They're having to now learn how to take their credit card out and fucking give donations. This is, I had never heard about this. I knew broadly this is accelerating uh, those who aren't familiar or comfortable with being online and paying or purchasing things online. Never once did I even consider that element. That's so a now, massive now, audience that's just opened up. So now you have people that are just for the first time experienced like, oh, I'm at home. I just walked to get a drink. I'm listening to the word and I just paid. I'm okay. No one stole my shit. It's, ah, man, it's almost like turning the clock back 10 years too. When people first started purchasing things online, they're a little bit more loose with what they're doing. That's that audience that have just swamped the market right now. Like that, I never even considered that. And there's so many elements to that for the benefit of online marketers. So now you go, now you have people that have never felt comfortable. And then now they're like, okay, I, I like this. You can't build models to predict an influx of new consumers online like the, we just had. Mm -hmm. Then you have on top of that, the, the, the buildings that just can't come back, like Sears, Jason Penney's, Macy's, like they just can't, they're, they're gonna do their best, but they're still gonna be social distancing. I've mm -hmm. never seen the markets as low. Um, we, we know that you're, you're gonna opt to order online. Yeah, you're gonna wanna be around people, you're gonna wanna go do things, but yeah. Coachella can happen, sporting can happen. <laughs> What if, what if on airplanes, every single middle seat is empty because you need the distance? What if every two seats are empty and planes have to exist like that? Yeah. That's yeah. just going to go everywhere. That's for, for e-commerce. I mean, you can, you can, there are already apps out there. Say if I want to try on uh, the new geek out sweater or something like that. Um, I can put on my VR headset, whatever, or even just hold up my phone. I can see what it looks like. It follows my arm movements and everything. People are going to start getting used to doing that or those built in applications. We're going to start to see pop up a lot more on checkout pages or even just add to cart sections. Like I think the ability to be more, com get more comfortable in purchasing, we're going to start to see a lot more functionality. That's a little bit more wide, widespread accepted. Um, right now it's still kind of early adopter days. Um, but we're going to see a lot more people getting more comfortable with trusting how things snug on them in the VR mode. I, I fully agree with you, especially when they're, uh, when Facebook push, pushes so aggressive on their portal and on their video talking and their, their chatting and the, their announcement that they're going to go try and compete with Twitch. Like they, they already have the audience and if video games are like the way that we're all going to connect, that shit's digital anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're sitting here going like, I, I've never been more excited and more motivated to, to have more people running online or learning how to go online or brands needing to go online, mm -hmm. they're going to shift. Um, this is my prediction. The, the amount of budgets that are no longer able to be driven from Priceline, Expedia, uh, Kayak, Airbnb. What was the mark on it? How, how many billion dollars just dropped off the, off the market? Shit, I don't even want to quote that, but I know, I, I, I don't, I'm sure I can Google this and find it. it, it but it, to, to the point of your message, it's, it's, there's this massive vacuum just waiting to be filled of spend, basically, and the cost, about, the dude, cost. What, what, I'm sorry to interrupt you because I'm so, so excited about this. What about buying cars? <laughs> yeah. Like, I have a Tesla. It's been sitting in there. I haven't fucking driven it in, in 35 days. Who's going to be rushing out to be like, and I'm sitting there going like, okay, I think I actually don't need a car or like that car anymore. Like why the fuck do I need to pay for a, for a car like that? Yeah. When I'm probably going to go three places. Ride shares jumping up for sure. So there's, there's just like this downward effect of even when we get back to normal, um, what is normal? Like how, what level of normal? The new, no, the new normal. Like that's, that's the thing. What are the long lasting effects going to be of this? And there will be many and they will be easy to spot. It's not a lot of people earlier on said, you know, things will get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. It's not going to be, it's going to be the new normal and it's going to be different and people are going to be able to notice it. At yeah. least for, at least for our industry, for a work standpoint, we'll be able to notice it. This has been an amazing call. I always love talking with you. Um, you know, I always come in with thoughts of where the conversation is gonna go, but we always end up kind of steering it down all these different roads and it's always a really a lot of fun. 
super knowledgeable. You're, as I said before, you're one of those guys that's extremely generous. Please don't stop doing that. It's creating changes in the industry. We're seeing more um, personas opening up, like we've mentioned, Jim Nico, Dudang's doing really good. More generosity with uh, giving, it'll propel the industry forward. Um, and it's great to hear all the cool things that you've been cooking up and working on and how big structured Sokol's uh, gotten. Uh, much, much love and thanks to you, buddy. Thanks, thanks for being on the show. Appreciate you. All right. Talk to you later, man.